So this morning um, gives me great pleasure to welcome back Anne Lovejoy, who's going to um, talk to us about an extremely timely talk it, topic. Um, you know how to how to homeschool and how to be a, a grandparent who helps homeschool your grandkids. Um, and this is a pretty informal. Um, presentation. So as things come up, if you want to ask questions, enter them into the, the chat box. You'll see the little speech bubble in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Or just um, raise your hand and ask your question. And so um, without further ado, we'll turn this over to Anne. Hey there. Um, I am really interested in homeschooling because I did homeschool my kids um, back in the day, which was a long time ago, but that uh, doesn't really change things. And I think one of the things a lot of us are thinking about now is how can we help our families? We have so many young families where parents are working from home still, um, the kids school probably not open, many of them are not, or they open and then they close again as problems occur. Um, Private schools don't have to do the same thing that public schools do. And here on the island, we have at least one of the private schools that is allowing kids to either show up in person one day and stay home the next day and do it online sometimes and not. So it's gonna take a while to figure out how best we can really support our families and, and our grandkids. Uh, but I think that the stumbling block for a lot of people is that they feel like they don't know how or they don't know what is involved. and. I would just encourage all of you to think about ways you can support your grandkids by not homeschooling, but by unschooling or by uh, bookless learning, sometimes I call it. When my kids were young, uh, my oldest was in third grade and my youngest was in first grade. And it just wasn't a great fit for us with the public school, which I love the public schools, I volunteered in them, but it wasn't really working for my kid and that didn't work for me. So I, at the time, kind of had a little tussle with the school district, but ended up getting the support of the uh, superintendent and was able to homeschool at home. So there I was with permission and still no clue what to do. But I've always been really drawn and attracted to the unschooling movement. And I, if there had been a Waldorf school on the island when my kids were little, like Madrona School, I would have put them in that school. And ironically enough, I was actually the director of the Madrona School for three years. <laughs> but by that time, my kids were grown and gone. Uh, but the model that I love so much about the Waldorf School, it's a, if any of you are not familiar with it, it's a movement that started in Germany in the 20s and 30s and really has blossomed. And it, most of the schools in Germany, the elementary schools, even through high school, are based on the Waldorf model. Um, and the, the increments are different from what we're used to. So kids are not taught to start reading until they're about eight. And it turns out that actually that's really a smart thing because children's eyes are not fully myelinized until they're like about eight years old. And so it's actually hard on their eyes to do much reading and, and find bitsy work early on. And much better for them to have a lot of free play, to run around, have hands-on experiential learning. And that's the most fun to do anyway. Um, when, when we were homeschooling, I had several other friends who were also homeschooling and some of them were suffering, the whole of them. They'd sit there using these horrible curricula that were developed for missionary families overseas. And they would be like, you're at the table, sit down, do this, and it's play school. And one of the things that the Waldorf School does is a, they incorporates a huge amount of movement. They sing, they dance, they practice different stuff. They run outside and have lots of recess. When they learn the math skills, and things like the multiplication tables, it's all done with sticks where it's clapping the sticks and chanting the chants and there's little chants that rhyme and they move and they trade sticks with each other and they move around the circle and it really gets into their whole muscle memory of how you learn the multiplication table in a way that's really refreshing. And the good news about all this stuff is that there's a lot of information online. There's a ton of homeschooling Waldorf parents um, and many, many support groups I would caution you that if you just start looking up homeschool online, you're very apt to get uh, a lot of information from more, um, maybe, well, from conservative Christian point of view, 
which may or may not be what you're interested in. And that's why I wanted to mention to, to look for the Waldorf uh, sites because you'll see a very different kind of approach and one that's much more hands-on. And for my own kids and for myself, the hands-on part has been so much more fun. I've had a number of people say, well, what did you do about math? And I would point out that cooking and baking is all about math. Half a cup of this, a teaspoon of that. How much do you, we have a weigh scales. You have to weigh that out. What does that actually look like? Um, an ounce of water, is that different from an ounce of flour? Huh, what's a liquid ounce? What's a, you know, a solid ounce? And, and so we did a lot of that kind of stuff. And then building projects where you're gonna measure something, measure twice, cut once, <laughs> right? We're, or sewing, when we learn to make costumes and make uh, all kinds of toys that they were interested in. So the hands-on part is really important. And your best friend for all this, if you're not particularly handy, is blue painter's tape. Um, <laughs> I used to use a staple gun, but actually the tape is more forgiving and it doesn't scratch your ankles so much. Uh, but the blue tape has been a huge <laughs> part of working with my grandkids now. I've had them two or three times a week since they were born and they're now seven and th four and a half. Since the pandemic started, I haven't had them as much. And so we've been doing more um, online in a different way. And one of the best ways we've found to interact like with a four-year-old or a seven-year-old is by um, FaceTime or what is that? What, where you're on your phone, right? Where you can see them and they can see you. And at first with the youngest one, it was kind of interesting because she'd get bored and I'd be end up looking up at the ceiling because she'd put the phone down somewhere and wander off. And I'd be like, hello, hello. But I realized if we've set up little projects, we could do things together. So she, then she really got into it. So she'd say, today, Granny, let's each look for something soft and show each other. Or let's look for something silly. Or let's look for something shiny. Or we'd look at each other's cats. Or we'd go in the garden and she'd show me her yellow poppies and I'd show her my yellow poppies. And she'd say, ah, I wish you could feel how silky they are. And I'd show her that I can pat my petals too. <laughs> But we did a lot of things together that way that was kind of surprising. And the more she got used to it, the better able she was to actually pay attention and follow up on it. And it was a little bit cool. Um, some of the other kids in the neighborhood thought it was really cool that she had learned to uh, master the art of, of being online with her granny and doing little projects together. So one of the other things uh, <laughs> I was going to mention that there's so much to free play that a lot of modern kids are unused to. Um, they don't, lots of kids do not get a lot of free play time. They get a lot of structured time, they get a lot of screen time. And learning to let go of the structure is, is part of the, I think part of the gift that we can give them because our generation grew up for the most part without television, without screen time as such. We didn't have devices phone hung on the wall <laughs> and it you know didn't follow you into the garden um so and we played outside and we were allowed to today i hear these stories about kids growing up in communities where they're not allowed to climb trees because it could be a liability or they're not allowed to play in the water because it's a liability and you think holy moly they're learning to be afraid of nature and some of the parents apparently have sort of gotten caught up in that too. Uh, there's a wonderful book called Last Child in the Woods. Have any of you seen that? That um, came out probably 15 years ago, but it really talks about the way that nature deficit syndrome is affecting our culture. And one of the things I love about the Waldorf tradition is that they make a nature table and every single day, raining, snowing, pouring, doesn't matter, you go out and walk around and find something cool, something beautiful, something interesting to bring home and put on your nature table. Or maybe there's one outside and one inside, but maybe it's a flower or a stone or an empty snail shell or a beautiful feather or a seed pod. It doesn't really matter what it is. It's, uh, it's just part of watching, looking, learning to connect with the natural world. And I feel like, again, this is a generational gift. We have memories of that, almost all of us. Even people born in the city used to spend a lot more time outside <laughs> playing in the street than the kids do now. So thinking about ways that we can enrich our grandkids' life experience 
by taking them outside or encouraging them to be outside, that's huge. And cell phones, weirdly enough, are part of that way to be connected to them. I can walk down to the farmer's market and show you know, my granddaughter what's going on on a Saturday. She can go with me on a walk through the woods or down to the beach. Um, and I can go with her on her walk down to the beach. So I just think part of it is, look, it's that bookless learning experience of really doing things together. Does that make sense? I see some head nodding heads. But I wondered if anyone had questions about what, uh, how to get started or how to work with the parents. I, I, uh, I used to teach and um, I, what you were talking about the Waldorf, I was working in a public school in California and they asked me to teach concrete math. That's what they called it. What concrete math is, is the sticks. Uh -huh. um, you know, a bundle of 10, um, th that kind of thing, or pebbles in, you know, egg cartons and that kind of thing. It was a teaching concrete things with things that were real to them instead of these little symbols called numerals. And, you know, the kids would like, uh, you know, these are some of the kids. I was working with a lot of special ed children and those little symbols meant nothing to them. So, um, but it, it, they sent me to UC Berkeley to learn about this concrete math. Can you believe this? And it was like, wow, it's really basic. It was really easy to teach. It was very successful. Yeah. Um, um, and uh, and I, I, when you said that about doing math with sticks and measurement and real life things that we all use and we will use for the rest of our lives, including our children, that is just the best way to teach math. Mm -hmm instead of out of a book. So I was just so delighted to hear you say that. And that, that I, I did that back in the 19, was it late 80s and 90s? And they thought it was revolutionary. <laughs> so, so that's just a comment of mine, but I, I, um, but I love that, that, that holistic, you know, whatever's happening in the world, using it as a lesson to teach, to make it real. So. Well, right, because abstract thinking doesn't really kick in for children until fairly late. Absolutely. Um, and hands-on certainly does. I mean, I can remember my little, my oldest being maybe two and carefully pulling apart a lily and counting the petals <laughs> as he decapitated this. But he knew what he was doing. And then Brussels sprouts he was counting. And then he was saying, sometimes there's 11 and sometimes there's 13. <laughs> <laughs> process and I think yep. part of it too is like being looser about right and wrong because right. so much of the schooling today is really aimed toward the test and they teach to the test and that drops out art and music and drama and so many things that actually are foundational in Waldorf um, and it doesn't mean you have to do the Waldorf thing but I think one of the blessings of it is when children learn to sing and recite and play an instrument and perform, they really get poise. And I remember when I was at the Waldorf school, the highs wanted some, some people at the high school were talking to me about how they could always tell the Waldorf kids because they were comfortable in their own skin and they really had this poise. They were very comfortable in the world, which is so untypical for high school kids, Absolutely. especially freshmen, right? So I thought, well, that, what a gift that is. But the hands-on pieces um, are something that it's really easy to forget because it's just so not important in the public school systems right now, or even some of the private school systems. But the other thing I'd like to point out is you may not have grandkids or kids of your own, or they may not be right on hand at close at hand, but there are a lot of kids around. And I think one of the pieces, well, I live in a small neighborhood and so all of us have you know, even though we're distanced and we're wearing masks and we're keeping our distance, we've all kind of joined in to keep an eye on some of the little kids. And, and I put like a bucket of big chalk out so they can draw pictures in front of my house or uh, flowers. Several of the neighbors put flowers and vegetables out for the kids to take it home if they want to. And we talk to them about how do you grow this? You know, what does it take? Or I give them seeds to plant and talk them through it. We have several uh, young adults here and don't stop with little kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Young adults who had never gardened and this 
pandemic is encouraging people to stay home and actually try things they haven't done. Uh, my grandkids love to bake, so we make cinnamon rolls and they do sourdough with me and we do yeast bread and they make, uh, you know, not just bread, but dragons and dinosaurs and unicorns and more interesting things than a simple loaf. Um, but again, they learn the process. They learn that you have to wait. Well, the dough is rising, then you do something else. Um, I just feel like we uh, we have a treasure that we can pass forward. And to any kid, any kid in your orbit, and there's no reason why we can't call our neighbor kids up on the phone and have a, a FaceTime conversation with them, right? Put the phone up when you're doing something fun. Look at this, I'm cleaning seeds. Do you believe it? Don't these seed heads look weird? When we pop them out, look what happens. Or mm -hmm whatever it is, right? And I know a number of, of grandparents who are reading to their grandkids on a regular basis. Um, one grandmother I know reads a bedtime story to her granddaughter who lives all the way across the country, but the parent, um, the parents have sort of split shifts and one of them is still going out because she's an essential worker. And so granny has taken on the job of reading the bedtime story over the phone. That's great. Showing the pictures. And I thought, you know, that's pretty great, really. Exactly. Yeah, they say, you know, parents, grandparents, family, neighbors were the first teachers. Yeah, and one powerful tool that can work even with our own kids is learning something together. Mm -hmm. Like not just being an expert, but showing how you learn. Yeah. That it's okay to fail that it may not come out right the first time, that it's it can be fun and funny to have a silly mistake, and then you can take it as a mistake and turn it around and make something interesting happen with it. Um, I think that piece of imagination, flexibility, and uh, the privilege of failure <laughs> is another thing that's kind of lost. Um, I knew a number of parents who were doing their kids' homework because they didn't want them to fail. Ugh. But that's a huge fail right there, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Thinking about ways that we can demonstrate, hopefully, our own maturity about the wisdom of letting go of perfectionism, of uh, letting go of having things on such a tight, um, tight schedule all the time. Like for a lot of these kids, if they're online eight hours a day for school, that actually sucks. That's a terrible thing to do to a kid. But if you can break it up and figure out ways to help them get up and move and dance and sing and have action, um, you can actually spend a tablet day with your kid <laughs> and, and be doing things together. Okay, I'm gonna have lunch now. What are you having, right? Uh, it's the human interaction that we're all missing. But I think too, it's the grace of aging and not worrying so much if you do it exactly right all the time. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. And this is Christina. I am curious um, how you do work in say reading, some activities where you would work in reading um, with the um, hands-on. What does Waldorf do to reinforce reading skills in this? wonderful play and hands-on type of um, instruction? Well, the cool thing is they don't really start the kids reading until about third grade, but in first grade, they're already drawing and painting shapes like M is mountains. So they make M mountains and they make, you know, different shapes that sound like, they're, and that's something you can see on any of those websites. Um, but, and they teach cursive first. It's beautiful, it's soft, and it turns out that there's been quite a lot of studies that brain development has actually assisted a great deal more hand-eye coordination, and actually the synapses in your brain are trained better by cursive than by ball and stick. And we have a, a two or three generations of kids that can't read cursive, which is cool because you can write secret notes that they don't know what it means, but <laughs> it's better for them, and we can often teach those skills because we had to do it, right? Back in the day, uh, that was the first drawing, writing that I learned. Um, and if even if you look at the old Babar books, for instance, which are actually super racist and weird, but they're written in cursive. <laughs> and, 
And so I thought that was kind of fun. I have to edit it when I was reading to the little ones, but um, but that cursive flow is really nice and it's easier for their hands. It's less rigid. Um, so that's one way to do it. And to, talk, you know, you of course we all do the thing of like, mmm, mama, right? Or mmm, mountain, that's the mmm noise, right? We can do all those things all the way along um, and make songs and stories about them. And that is one of the Waldorf pieces is there's a lot of stories that have specific little illustrations that feed into learning the letters um, and the numbers in the same way too. And again, very hands-on like what Karen was talking about, um, where a lot of that is done with objects. Um, yeah, it can be super, super simple. I was going to show you one of the funniest things when Oliver, who's now seven, was born, I bought a dozen uh, washcloths at Rite Aid on their dollar days and they're bright colors. I don't know if you can see them, but they're in this jar and there's been, now there's a few other things added to it. Those washcloths have been played with constantly for seven years and have been part of the counting games, have been part of the covering games. They turn into capes, they turn into um, blankets for the toys, they've turned into rivers. With I mean, It's amazing to me that the simplest, simplest things become fascinating to children if they're not, we don't egg them on and tell them what to do, right? But let them explore it on their own. And one of the saddest things to me is seeing kids who say, what am I supposed to do with this? And that to me is like a crippling piece from, I don't mean to keep knocking public education, but, and it isn't only public private schools do this too, but it's like getting past the perfect and getting past there's a right and a wrong way to do this. And if you choose the wrong thing, you're gonna have to be, someone's gonna explain to you how to do it properly. Now, certainly there's a place for that, but I think one of the coolest imaginative things is like what a kid can do the toilet paper roll Maybe not one, but 15 or 20, you got a robot, right? <laughs> or something. <laughs> and I just, so I save a lot of things like uh, these uh, berry buckets, right? They've made hot air balloons with the berry buckets stuck on them. They've made houses for mice. They've made all kinds of different things out of these simple, simple things. And that's the other piece. It doesn't mean you got to spend a lot of money. You can still go to the library and get library books and you can read them online. Um, one of the things I love to do is um, like this one I brought, it's called, we're going on a bear hunt. And it's a, a rhyme story that's as old as the hills. We're going on a bear hunt and you do, we're gonna catch a big one. What a beautiful day, right? We're not scared. And then you can sort of act it out with them and they get really into it. And that's part of that. They can do that at home. Um, but doing those kind of chanting, moving things are really fun. Even with older kids, they'll look a little sheepish, but they'll jump right in and do it too. <laughs> Actually, adults do that. Yeah. We were, uh, Marsha Kilbane, uh, we were doing a karaoke and I forget what was the genre, but that was her song we're going on a bear hunt or, and, and she, we did that. And we, she was there and we all did it, man. You know, here we are in our upper decades and we just jumped right on in. Uh -huh. I love going on a bear hunt. Exactly. Oh, that, was, that was such fun. I it will never forget that. Yeah. That was great. Fun. Yeah, but not all kids get to go on a bear hunt. So you can take right. you know, the neighborhood on a bear hunt. That's kind Absolutely. of fun. Yeah. Grown up and kids, right? Yep. Just simple things like that. Another thing that's kind of wonderful, and in fact, um, Rita gave my kids this book. It's called The Lost Words. And it says, when the most recent edition of Oxford Junior Dictionary came out, and it's widely used in schools around the world, about 40 common words concerning nature were dropped out, including acorn, bluebell, dandelion, fern, heron, kingfisher, otter, willow. Instead, they put in attachment, blog, broadband, bullet point, cut and paste, and voicemail. <laughs> so here's this amazing book. And, you know, you probably can't, can't really see it so great. But wonderful free illustrations of natural things and stories about what they are. And my grandkids got really taken with chestnuts. 
and there's a big chestnut tree down, in, down by uh, Wyatt House. But by the time we got interested in the chestnuts, the chestnuts were all gone. So I put out a post on Buy Nothing Bainbridge and asked if anyone had chestnuts. And I got offers of chestnut paste, roasted chestnuts, canned chestnuts, preserved chestnuts. And I was like, no, actually, I mean the real just nuts, right? And finally, somebody said, oh, yeah, we have some. They were a prop for a play at BPA. And so we sent away for them and got them on Amazon from New York. And they gave them to me. <laughs> and I was like, wow. Yeah, really wow, right? I mean, what's, the name, what's the name of that book now, Anne? That's it's called The Lost Words. And you can get it, Sheila, you can order it at, I got it at um, Eagle Harbor Bookstore, and if it's not in, they'll order it. It's a, such a beautiful book. It is just, you can tell stories, you can draw from it. I, I was just so taken with it. And I thought, and I thought Anne would probably like it in her grandkids. So it's, I've got one at my house, but she's got one at her house too. Yeah. I just thought it was so, and I gave to, my daughter's a teacher at Silverwood School in Palsbo, a small private school. And I gave it to um, a couple of the teachers there just for the younger kids, be, just because it's, I think it's so amazing. It is amazing. And you know, the, the other grandmother in our family bought one to have at her house, oh. which is super cool too. And yeah. then Lexi just bought this for the kids. It's called The Keeper of Wild Words. Oh. And it talks about like how poppies open and you can watch them and the petals popping and what the violets smell like. And just it's sort of an interactive go out and play and look around. This is a wren, this is a robin. Um, and a lot of parents don't know those things. <laughs> so it's a learning together kind of book too. And that one's called The Keeper of Wild Words. Um, but they're fabulous. And another book that I use a lot with my kids and myself, and this is kind of different, it's called On Food and Cooking um, by Harold McGee. And he is a food scientist. And if you like, you're baking with the kids and they're like, Granny, why does the baking soda work like that? You're like, oh, I'm so glad you asked me that question. <laughs> and then <laughs> you can read all about baking soda or eggs or honey or there's like a 15 page section about honey or sugar or, you know, and the sugar part starts with slavery <laughs> and, uh, and moves through, you know, the whole de development of beet sugar and all this stuff. It's really fascinating. And I love things like that. And when it comes naturally out of something you're doing, it, it, it's less didactic and it doesn't come across to the kid as yawn, right? You're trying to shove something down my brain. It's more like, look at this. This is so cool. Um, yeah. And, you know, another thing that reminded me of that when they, we were learning the alphabet is at the the little pharmacy down here in, by, in Winslow Green has the ABCD puzzles and you can pull all the letters out. So the kids have one and I have one and we play puzzle games back and forth. Like Ollie will say, pick three letters and make a word and he'll pick the letters for me and I'll pick the letters for him. So you can do that kind of stuff too, which is fun, right? And we made alphabet cookies more than once. Or spelled their name and dough, bread dough, that kind of thing. So the learning to recognize the shapes of the letters and the sounds of the letters can be associated with cookies. That's always a good thing, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The other book, another book, Anne, that I think you guys, I think is really cool too, is a book called Animalia. Yes. And it's, and it's got, of course, all the letters of the alphabet and then a million things in there to find that are that letter. And there's so many things to see on each page. And, you know, and as they, when they're little, they, they do the bigger things. But then as they get a little older, they can pick out the smaller things as well. And it's just amazing how many things I love. I had that for my grandson, who's now 24. And then, um, had it for my had it for my granddaughter and then my my younger grandson as well. So it's a great book as well. Yeah, a lot of the sort of art art learning yes. books are much more fun than the Dick and Jane stuff, which is pretty lethal actually. <laughs> Another um, couple of things I wanted to mention is um, when we were doing our homeschooling, and I had bought at a yard sale or something a few volumes of this American history series that was. And I was reading through it and thought, this is not right. <laughs> and I went in and got the um, Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States. 
And has any, Karen, definitely, I see you know that. Um, it's a very different, yeah, it's, it's a very different take, but it's a really good one to work on with kids a little at a time and talk about the way stories shift because we're embarrassed or the way stories shift because we want to feel, believe this or that. Um, another great site is called Edutopia, yes. E-D-U-T-O-P-I-A. And it's a um, kind of a social justice, anti-racist teaching platform that works for kids of all ages and their parents and for all of us. And to talk about those things together is so refreshing because kids are just kind of learning and they're hearing a lot. I mean, all kids are hearing a lot about what's going on out there and why. So having some teaching tools to explain what the roots of racism and slavery really are and how they've infiltrated. And it doesn't have to be heavy handed, but I think the, um, the fact that we can talk about it with them openly is really important because it helps them understand, it normalizes the whole conversation and that's what we got to do. Yeah, I, was, I remember growing up, it was like, uh, you know, you do not talk about religion or politics. <laughs> it's like, yeah. And then we become teenagers and adults and not being able to do it because we've never done it and have it respectful discussions. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I've never bought that. I never listened to it myself, <laughs> but it was something I was told, especially as a young woman. Well, you don't want to get into that young lady. Leave that to the guys. Yeah, it's like, but uh, yeah, so that's changing. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. Um, but I think for all of us, like, that's a piece to talk to the, the kids about too, is like learning to be more comfortable with discomfort, mm -hmm. like learning to unlearn. And they're just starting, so they have more flexibility. They haven't been brainwashed yet, hopefully, about anything, um, good, bad, or indifferent, and sort of helping them to understand how to think. Like, that skill does not get taught in schools. And we can't expect the schools to be everything. You know, that's not fair. And so when we're amplifying or helping kids learn or talking about wisdom as opposed to book learning, <laughs> What, what kinds of knowledge there are in the world, the knowledge of your hands. I mean, I personally would love to see trade schools come back in a big, big way, because for one thing, you know, there was a company on the island that was advertising for almost a year that they were gonna, they needed apprentice electricians to start at, what was it, 67.50 an hour or something like that, right. right? And couldn't get anybody. Right. I thought, seriously? I mean, that's amazing. So, but, to bring back respect for hands-on learning, bring back respect for trades, for domestic art. My mom <laughs> was so uh, kind of ashamed of me for being really interested in baking and cooking and sewing and knitting. <laughs> and she thought it was a disgrace to the modern woman. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, I felt kind of, conflicted about it for a while and I was just like you know I'm just sorry for you because what a rich incredible history there is in all this kind of work and how beautiful to make things for your people right so yes. making and mending has become part of my education like the kids bring everything that's broken to me and if I can't fix it Lexi probably can and we talk about making and mending and using and that's education every bit as much as you know teaching them the two times twos or whatever so I guess we should all be teaching each other to count backwards by seven, right? Isn't that the... <laughs> if well, we that's a cognitive test that we have to take. Exactly. <laughs> and we'll get to brag about it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> when my mom had to do that a few times too many, they said, draw the circle. And she made kind of a circle. And then they said, put the numbers on. And she just gave them a look and said, oh, you know perfectly well where the numbers go. <laughs> Good for her. I don't know. She doesn't come into any of that. <laughs> but again, it's the grace of flexibility and the grace of imperfection that I feel is a, one of our great gifts to each other and to our kids and to our grandkids and maybe our communities as well. Tough stuff to talk about, but it's really good for kids to have. Like, yes. what, even if you do like what Mary was saying, is like you read it and you talk to them about the questions you have about it. Um, it's just so encouraging. And picking something to read together, that's pretty sweet too, right? 
Thank you all. This is really fun. You it know, is. I was good. talking to a friend the other day about how we've sort of lost our ability to have a conversation because it's so much safer to have an expert up there telling you something than to actually voice your own opinions or ideas that somebody might shoot down or call you out for. <laughs> right. But how much more fun it is to exchange, oh, here's what I do, or here's how I learned that. It's, I feel like that is just so refreshing and, and you learn a lot more about each other this way, don't you?